Amen, and thank you, Tim. If you would go ahead and, and take your Bibles and open it to the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 21, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 21. We're going to look at that entire chapter here in just uh, one moment. Uh, the people of North Clay and even those that uh, uh, are taking advantage of our live stream that are not members of North Clay, maybe they live in other parts of the, uh, the country, uh, have been uh, very encouraging, and we appreciate that uh, so uh, very much. Uh, but one of the things that they really enjoyed is the pause and stop button uh, on the uh, live stream. And so let me assure you, when we return to Gav, at, and, and Josh said the mute button. And, and so uh, uh, the, none of those three things will be available. Uh, once we return to, to North Clay, okay? I hate to disappoint you. I know that uh, you like innovation in, in worship, but those innovations will not persevere. They will not endure uh, until the end. Again, we do appreciate the encouragement. Uh, I am thankful uh, for this, this team that's worked week in and week out uh, to make this possible. Uh, I, uh, as I sat at home this morning and our power flickered uh, just for a moment, uh, Thank you, Mark Duncan at Alabama Power and Brandy Vines uh, for keeping our power on. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I, I thought, well, if, what if the power goes out at the North Clay facility? And I was thinking, well, I guess uh, my, my iPhone uh, at, at uh, my office chair at my house might have to, to work for the live stream this morning. But we're thankful uh, that uh, the power is on. We're able to come to you uh, this, uh, this morning and... Uh, in this way. Now, just kind of a word about uh, where we have been, where we are, where we're going. Uh, Josh mentioned this is Sermon 7. It's one of the longer Easter series that, that I've done. And uh, I do want to extend it one more week. Uh, many people call chapter 21 the, the epilogue of the Gospel of, of John. In fact, uh, some would It's been very popular uh, uh, to make kind of uh, snide comments about the, the dullness of the disciples as they're depicted throughout uh, the Gospels. That they don't quite get it, and, and even they collapse uh, at, at the ultimate time of, uh, of pressure upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, it's, all of that happened according to God's plan and timetable so that they would see, they would experience, we would see, and we would understand the necessity of the working of the Holy Spirit for us to live out the gospel, for us to have the, the boldness to, to proclaim it, the, and the faithfulness to live out its implications uh, in these days until the actual return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think it's important to say uh, a bit of a final uh, word there. And so uh, this morning we look at John 21, and this, uh, this is the, the third time uh, that, John, that John records that Jesus is going to appear uh, to the disciples. Uh, some count uh, th that Jesus appeared after his resurrection uh, ten times, plus one more uh, to, the, uh, to uh, the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And so uh, it is interesting that it does seem like uh, Jesus, uh, during that 40 days uh, after the resurrection and uh, prior uh, to Pentecost, uh, prior to his ascension, that he came sporadically or occasionally uh, to these disciples, uh, seemingly uh, appearing out of nowhere, as, as it were. And that he didn't stay with them for that uh, entire 40-day period. That he came and he went. That just seems to be the way the Gospels explain uh, uh, his uh, post-resurrection, pre-ascension ministry uh, to them. Uh, and I think, again, it was all according to God's plan and his uh, uh, means through which he would prepare them for what he had uh, for them and, and for us uh, in uh, the future. And so what I think we, we see is uh, uh, both a reinstatement of the Apostle Peter, and I think by extension all of the disciples, that Jesus once again welcomes them into his uh, fellowship. And again, that, that they are to be reminded 
that the commission that he had given to them, the, the apostolic anointing that he had placed upon them had not lapsed, that it was ongoing, and that they were a part of God's plan for the proclamation of the gospel, for the story of the resurrected Christ to be preserved and proclaimed until the day of his return. So with those things being said, let's turn our attention to the text this morning. Again, verse 1, Gospel of John, chapter 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Uh, Simon Peter, uh, Thomas called the twin, uh, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat dragging uh, the net full of fish for they were not far from land but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land they saw a charcoal fire in place which with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And so Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this, saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. And the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is that? that is going to betray you. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. We know that his testimony is true. Now, there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for your Son, we thank you for what he came to accomplish. We thank you for your spirit that is still applying 
the work of the Son to the hearts of men. May you be praised. May you be glorified. I pray that today that we would speak your truth. That you would take your truth. That your spirit would be among us. And that he would work uh, to bring about uh, that which would glorify you even through all of eternity. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We can often play the game, why does God do what God does the way God chooses to do it? It would seem to me that had God chosen to operate in this fashion, He certainly could have. And that is namely that periodically the Lord Jesus Christ would dramatically appear in the world and demonstrate His authority and power through the miraculous. Again, proving over and over again that indeed He was the one who was crucified. And yes, indeed, He had defeated death. And that He was indeed the Savior of the world. That there was hope because of what He had done. There was actually salvation, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, because of these things uh, being true. That would seem to be very dramatic, very powerful, and that would seem to maybe be far more effective than somebody like me standing up here and giving you second-hand, third-hand accounts of what God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, or, or maybe we should just simply, since God has chosen not to do it that way, maybe, maybe we should be, be a much more sensational in our approach, much, much, much more uh, vibe, much more dynamic, mu- much more uh, aesthetically pleasing, glamorous and glorious. Uh, we want to do these things so that people will be attracted to the, to the glitz, so to speak. Well, all of those things would seem to me to be dramatically misguided. If I could say anything about my philosophy or my approach to ministry, at least one of the words that I would use would be the word ordinary. Ordinary. What do I mean? The ordinary means of God's grace. The ordinary things that God has chosen through which to communicate His truth, through which people will be saved, through which the saved will be sanctified. That is, you don't need bulky guys lifting heavy weights. Uh, You you don't need really cute young people uh, dancing to a a really nice beat of a a song. Uh, You don't don't need uh, a lot of these things that every church thinks is so essential. You don't need smoke machines. You don't need dramatic lighting. You don't need to make sure that your church looks just as much like a a theater or a nightclub as it possibly can. That that God has chosen to work through the Word and the Spirit. Through this thing we talk about as communion, the the elements of communion, and the Word of God. That, That there's nothing that really can enhance the Word of God. How do you enhance that which has infinite power? How how do you enhance the infinite power of the Spirit to use what He said He would use to accomplish what He said He would do? How do you do that? And so I I think there is something. And and the Puritan word was plainness. Plainness. Uh, they They get a bad rap. They really do. They were a very joyful people. Uh, They often get painted and uh, depicted in the paintings as these very somber, sober people. And to be sure, sometimes in the Christian life there is a place for somberness and sobriety. I'm, I'm not dismissing that. But they also were very joyful people given to celebrations and to festivals. And so, again, it would seem to me that if God wanted to do that which was dramatic to bring about conversion, He would have chosen to do that from the very beginning. But He took these guys that had been such colossal failures and were so very ordinary. There is not anything special about these guys at all. And He says, you know what? 
Even though you failed me, I'm still, I'm not changing my plan. I'm leaving, you're staying, and you're going to do what I have called you to do because my spirit is coming as I promised, as I tried to instruct you. You didn't listen, but I told you, he's coming and you're going and you're going to work. You're going to do the work that is going to build my kingdom, that's going to take this gospel throughout the world, and I am going to save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's the way it's going to be. And that's the way it's always been. And that's the way it's always going to be. Until the day, this very same Lord Jesus that cooked fish on the seashore comes back on that white horse in the clouds of heaven and brings all things to their appropriate end. Uh, we got into a bit of discussion previously, and I had a discussion this week about uh, premillennial and postmillennial, and uh, we all agree we're panmillennial, that things are going to pan out the way God plans for it to pan out. We can have some opinions, and the Scripture gives us some hints as to how He's going to bring things to their appropriate end, but be sure it will be their appropriate end. That those who have trusted in Christ will be vindicated, and those who have rejected Him will be condemned. That is the appropriate end of all things. So, with those things being said, let's look at this this morning. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Jesus appears on the seashore. John says that the disciples are back in the uh, area of Galilee, uh, that area in, where, in which Jesus began His ministry, in which He calls these first uh, disciples. These uh, disciples were Galileans by birth. Jesus had grown up in Galilee and in the small town of Nazareth. Uh, John mentions here, probably because at the time he wrote this gospel, uh, the lake there that uh, is uh, fed by the Jordan River uh, was not primarily known as the Sea of Galilee, but again, uh, the lake known as Tiberias, or the sea uh, known as uh, Tiberias. And so it's the same lake. It's up uh, north of Jerusalem, just up the Jordan River. We're told that seven of the disciples were present. We're not told where the other four were were. Uh, if it were an important detail that God wanted us to know, it'd be right there. There's no sense speculating as to why there were seven. Uh, we'll talk a bit, lot, a, a bit about biblical numbers here in a minute. I'm not a huge biblical numer numerology guy, but uh, uh, maybe there's some significance to seven being there. Maybe there's not. Uh, I'll leave that one uh, to you. But the point is, Jesus comes to them. He had been away from them uh, uh, for uh, evidently a period of time, long enough for them to go from Jerusalem up back into their home region, into Galilee. And in verse 3, Peter's looking around, and I can imagine, uh, okay, guys, we've been waiting, and we've been waiting. Let's, just, let's, let's do something. Let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. Now, remember, I, I, don't, I don't think that they broke out their $75,000 bass boat and, uh, you know, got, got all their monofilament lines out and all of this type stuff. Remember, they were commercial fishermen. Uh, they, they were going at it not as a hobby, not to pass the time, but probably to make some money. In fact, maybe possible, Mrs. Peter may have looked over at Mr. Peter and said, hey, instead of just sitting around the house waiting for this Jesus fellow to come back, why don't you go out and make a living, boy? Go catch some fish. Go put some food on this table. We don't know. But many, including John MacArthur, really thought that they went fishing because they were cashing it in. Even after the resurrection, they were not exactly sure. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if this was just Peter saying, hey, let's do something even if it's wrong. You know, sometimes that's not the worst philosophy in the world. Instead of just sitting around doing nothing. I mean, you know, if you do nothing, you can be sure nothing will happen. Go do something. And so they went out to do what they knew best, namely fishing. I'm mean, quite sure they felt very confident to go out and once again return to this trade that they were so very familiar with. And yet John tells us they went out and they caught nothing. That may remind us of this reality. Without Jesus in it, we can do nothing. I am entirely dependent upon God to bless that which I do. I'm responsible to do what He's told me to do, but I'm dependent upon Him to bless it. And uh, 
sometimes I think we find in life, we're going to go do this, and I'm going to do that, and all of a sudden you find out, you know what? No, you're not. No, you're not. That God's not going to bless it. In fact, He's going to frustrate it. Because I've placed a peculiar call upon your life, and you're going to follow after me. Now, that doesn't, that's, I'm not saying everybody should be in vocational ministry. I, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying, we need to be reminded, we can throw the nets out all we want to. Whether it's in business, or whether it's in ministry. And if God is not there to bless it, our nets will always come up empty. They'll always come up empty. So, they had caught nothing, and then just as the day was breaking, this fellow that they don't recognize shows up on the seashore. And much like an earlier encounter uh, recorded in uh, Luke's Gospel, this fellow suggests that I know y'all been doing this all your life. I know you're an expert fisherman. I'm just a carpenter. But why don't you do it this way? Why don't you throw that net over on the other side? I don't know if they did it mumbling and grumbling. Who is this knucklehead standing up there telling us how to fish? I mean, who? I dare him even suggest that we don't know what we're doing. Or, or maybe it was common that maybe... There was an elevated point on the seashore that somebody standing there maybe could see the bait fish breaking the, the surface, which would mean that there were larger fish after them and they were feeding. And so maybe he saw that and said, hey, cast over there. And they said, okay, that, maybe that's a good thing. I, we don't know. We're not told. But they did and they caught so many fish that they could not bring it in. It was so heavy that these seven fishermen, seven supposedly strong, rugged, healthy men, could not bring in the 153 fish. I assume, if you think about 153 fish, if they weighed a pound apiece, they'd be 153 pounds. I would think seven men could adequately bring in 153 pounds of fish in a net. Of course, the net would weigh a certain weight, and it was soaking wet. But I'm just saying, these were probably pretty good fish, pretty good-sized fish that they had uh, caught. And, and so, we're told then that Jesus is recognized, and again, the disciple whom Jesus loved, again, that's not a brag, that's a statement of humility, that John was always amazed that Jesus Christ loved him. Okay, We all ought to be amazed. That Jesus Christ loves us. Me, most of all. How amazed I should be. How humbled I should be. That he has lavished his love upon me. And so, this disciple cries out, Well, it, it, it's the Lord. It's the, it's the Lord. Now, one of the things you can kind of characterize in the gospel, sometimes John speaks, but Peter acts. Now, that's not always consistent. What does Peter do? He jumps in the creek. He jumps in the water. He grabs his outer garment and impetuously, uh, maybe foolishly, jumps in. Now, my understanding is from the text, they're about 100 yards out. Uh, I would hate to try to swim 100 yards at this point in my life, particularly with my inner and outer garments around me. But uh, he does. Uh, he, maybe he acts before he thinks. I cannot help but, but think of uh, the scene from the movie Forrest Gump. AMC sanitized version only, okay, uh, where he sees Captain Dan and walks off the end of his ship and the ship goes running into the bank and he comes swimming up to Captain Dan. Uh, I don't know if that's the way we should depict Peter or not, but uh, at, at any rate, uh, Peter jumps in and uh, uh, he comes uh, to the shore. Just a word to, to note that I'm going to say a a bit about later in verse 6. We're told that the haul was so great, or the catch, the catch was so great, they were not able to haul it in. Uh, that, that word translated haul is el kusai. We see a form of that word earlier in John's Gospel, John 6, 44. We'll say more about that because we're going to see it again here in just a moment. So Jesus is recognized. Uh, John speaks of him. Peter jumps in uh, the water. They come to the shore, and uh, uh, Jesus is actually preparing 
breakfast, breakfast for them on, on a fire. And uh, uh, then he says, well, come on, bring, bring some more fish that you, you've just called. Uh, called. And so uh, Simon Peter evidently goes back to the boat and helps haul the, the net ashore. And, and they count 153 uh, fish. Now, as I said, I'm not a big Bible numbers guy. That three is significant, that seven is significant, that twelve is significant, that forty is I mean, okay, I'm not, I'm not just saying there's no significance in, the, uh, in numbers, but is 153 significant? The answer is I don't know, okay? I don't know. Uh, there's, there, I'm sure you can Google it and find any number of this and that on it. I will tell you the one thing that I ran across, I'd never seen this before, and uh, it's kind of interesting, but uh, uh, 153, uh, one of the multiples would be 3 times 51. If you want to write this down, I, I know some of you are mathematically challenged, but 3 times 51. 51 is 3 times 17. If you took 7 units, you could make a 3 triangles with each Line of the triangle having 17 units in it, 351s. Uh, uh, I don't know, 17 is a prime number, uh, so that's an irreducible number. Maybe, maybe not. You do the math for yourself, uh, uh, not while I'm preaching, okay? That's for later, okay? Uh, so don't, don't be scribbling on your pencil and paper right now. But that's an interesting thing. We don't know. But we can say for sure these were, this was a commercial endeavor. There's seven fishermen. We're going to split them up so we can go sell them uh, in the marketplace uh, for uh, profit. And so Jesus has prepared uh, the breakfast. He's invited them. He says in verse 12, come and have breakfast. Come, come join me for breakfast. And here's the thing in, in the ancient world. Dining with someone, eating a meal with someone was a big deal. That meant that you were in fellowship with them, that you welcomed them. You remember uh, the Pharisees turning their nose up at Jesus eating with the tax collectors, with sinners? You did not do that. If, 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 if you were a respectable person, you, you did not have table fellowship with the unsavories of the world. And I believe Jesus is saying very clearly to these disciples, you are in fellowship with me because of me. I've taken the initiative to restore you into my service. I'm going to sustain you. Just as I've fixed this meal for you, I'm going to sustain you. Now, one quick side road here. Uh, I, I mentioned previously in verse 6, we see the word to haul, or the phrase to haul. Uh, we find again in verse 11, uh, the same Greek word translated haul. Uh, the Greek is elkuo, that's the root word, the verb elkuo. And again, the form here is elkusen. And it's the word that appears in John chapter 6, verse 44, when Jesus says that no man can come to him unless the Father draws. Draws. Now, so many of us good old Baptist boys, we like to speak with Jesus so softly and sweetly woos us. Okay? He's, he's begging. He's standing at the door. He's knocking. All of that. And I'm not going to say that's a totally irrelevant concept. But the word el kuo is used here, and as it's used throughout Scripture, it is used of irresistibly bringing something to yourself and meeting with resistance. That the one doing the drawing always overcomes the resistance. It's used in secular Greek literature of even drawing water. As R.C. Sproul remarked, nobody ever wooed water out of a well. No, no, nobody ever said, come here water, pretty, pretty, please, come here water. The water was unfailingly and irresistible drawn by a superior force. And I would submit to you, God always takes the initiative in salvation. He irresistibly draws those whom He has determined. John 6, 37, all the Father gives to me will come to me and I will raise them up on the last day. The working of the Spirit in our salvation. God draws. Again, there's a great difference between fallen image bearers and fish. I get it. But it is informative that it's the same word here 
and John's the same writer. They were, he hauled the fish in. He elkuoed the fish in. He drew them in. He hauled them in. God works to haul people to Jesus because in and of ourselves, we ain't coming. We ain't coming. We're not taking the Spiritually dead people have to be hauled to Jesus. Just as the infirm man had to be hauled to Jesus and dropped down through the roof. They, he didn't come of his own power. He came because he was brought. We're brought by the Holy Spirit. That was my little side road for the day. Disciples eat with Jesus. Upon the completion of the meal, Jesus addresses Peter personally and particularly. We're told they have finished uh, the breakfast, and Jesus is going to a- engage in this threefold series of asking and answering. Okay? Jesus begins to quiz Peter, and he asks him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And again, most of us are aware of the the, the love that Jesus, or the word that Jesus uses, that word agape, or agapeo. Again, it's a, a word that uh, often finds God as its subject of the, the, the giving, sacrificial, powerful, active love of God. Uh, and uh, Jesus wants to know, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me more than these? Now, again, it's, it's debatable who or what do the these refer to. It's kind of an evenly divided opinion among pastors and commentators. Uh, it seems to fit. Peter, you have said that you would lay down your life for me, even though everyone else falls away in this time of crisis that's coming, that I've told you was coming, that you would stick with me to the end, that you would lay down your very life for me. At least in terms of what's recorded, we really don't have the other disciples making such a bold proclamation, but Peter did. So, Peter, do you still want to step out on a limb and say you love me more than these other disciples? Are you ready to still say those things that you would lay down your life for me? That very well could be what Jesus has in mind. Or, maybe because Peter had said, let's go fishing, boys. We need to get busy. Maybe Jesus was saying, Peter, I see all of this equipment around here on the seashore. I see the boat. I see the nets. I see you've already kind of enlisted the other guys. Do you love me more than you love these things that were so familiar to you and probably so profitable to you? Do you love me more than these material, temporal things? Do you love me? Are you going to be willing to lay down those nets once again and follow me? I'm not sure that both concepts are mutually exclusive. It may be that Jesus has both of them in mind. Do you still want to make such a bold proclamation, Peter? And Peter, are you ready to leave these things behind once again? Because I have a plan for you. And so, this quiz, uh, quizzing and answer uh, continues. Peter's uh, response is that you know that I phileo you. And we know that's a, a kind of a, a lesser type of of love. One commentator says, you know, Jesus asked him, do you love me 100%? And Peter says, yeah, I love you 60%. Uh, something like that. Again, I love you like a friend. It's kind of uh, that bit. I, I can remember in my uh, dating days in high school, I had a lot of girls tell me, I, I just want to be your friend. I just want to be your friend, Tim. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing more cold and heartless than a girl telling you, I just want to be your friend. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, Peter saying, I, I just want to be buddies, Jesus. I just want to be buddies, Jesus. And so, Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, well, you know that I phileo you. And Jesus says, well, tend my sheep. First, he tells them to feed his sheep. Then he tells Peter to tend his sheep. And then there's a a third time Peter, uh, Jesus asks, Well, Jesus, do you indeed phileo me? Phileo me? And Peter's response is in the affirmative that he does. And 
maybe in exasperation and maybe even just coming to an end to himself uh, there in verse 17. Lord, you know everything. You know my heart. I do phileo you. I need to agape o you. But I do phileo you. Maybe the right prayer is, Lord, I love you. Help me to love you more. More love for thee, O Christ. More love for thee. Maybe that was Peter's prayer. It definitively and definitely should be our prayer. I love you, Lord. I say that I would die for you, Lord. But am I going to live for you, Lord? My prayer is more love to you, O Lord. And so in this threefold, which seems to parallel the three denials that Peter had engaged in a few nights prior, I believe that Jesus is again reinstating, reinstalling Peter as a disciple. You failed me, but I still have a plan. Just as a word of application, we've all failed Jesus Christ. We've all denied Him more than three times. We've all come to crisis points, which either by our silence or even by our very own proclamations, we've denied the Lord Jesus Christ. He is ready and willing to restore. It seems significant that Jesus takes the time to call Peter out particularly. I think it may say a a word about how we do Christian ministry. It seems like when there is a colossal failure among the brethren and the sistren, we simply want to gloss it over. It's all okay. We all sin. Every, every, everybody's a sinner. It's okay. Just, you know, no harm, no foul. It seems like what Jesus put Peter through was rather painful. It probably caused Peter to think, Wretched man that I am. But I believe that was part of God's process. Part of the the great physician healing the soul of Peter. Using this to break his heart so that it can be remolded for use. For the very purposes of God. Many times in the church, we we don't need to gloss over one another's sins. Sometimes we need to probe. We need to probe to the point in which there's brokenness so that there can be healing by God Himself. I would submit to you that until there's brokenness, there's really no ultimate healing. The other thing that I I want to pull out of this very very quickly before we, we move and close, there in verse 16, in the second of the, the questions, instead of feed my sheep, Jesus says to Peter, tend my sheep. Tend is a translation of a form of the word poimain, which is the word shepherd, which is one of the words for pastor. And I think that Jesus is saying to Peter, and he's saying that all would follow in the Apostle Peter's footsteps. And I would ask you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 for just one moment. 1 Peter chapter 5, I want you to see this. That this moment, from failure to restoration, always remained in Peter's mind. That he had failed, that Jesus had restored, and that Jesus had peculiarly charged him, and I believe charged every apostle, and then charged every person that would take up the, the mantle of eldership to tend, to shepherd in the model of the good shepherd to shepherd my flock to as Jesus said I am the good shepherd I lay down my life for my sheep you know pastoring is a interesting thing Um, uh, we all want to be successful in whatever we do it's a man thing it's a man thing. We want, to be success- we want to be noted as being successful. So I think over the course of my life, I guess the first thing I ever wanted to be was a, a great athlete. 
I didn't quite make it. Uh, I wasn't even a good athlete. Um, then I wanted to be rich. And all the fundamentals were in place for me to accumulate great wealth, as I've said recently. I wanted to be the guy in the church, the preacher came to me and said, listen, I've got ten guys that need to go to children's camp, and they haven't got the money. Can you write the check? And I could write the check. I wanted to be that guy. And I think in the wisdom of God, neither of those things were given to me for my, because of my extreme hubris, my extreme pride. That he couldn't entrust me with athletic ability because I know good and well I would have abused it. If I had been a great football player, I would have broken every school in the Southeastern Conference. I would have fleeced every one of them before I signed with that great university down in South Alabama called Auburn University. But I would have taken all their money. That he didn't allow me to have great wealth. Had I acquired the cars and the boats and the houses and the condos and all that, how proud I would have been. And even now, he still knows my frailty. I've told you many times before, I would love to pastor a megachurch. I would love for North Clay to be a megachurch. Uh, the truth is, we're really not a small church. I looked it up this morning. The average membership of Baptist churches is 327. We're right in that average category, quite honestly. In fact, most of those that have 327 have more than 50% that have not attended that church in the last year. We're not quite in that category yet. But we're gaining on it, unfortunately. Tend my sheep sacrificially live for my sheep. Be willing to lay down. You may not know what the world will look at as great success, but I'm calling you to live sacrificially for the sake of my sheep. And Peter reminds us of that. He extends this to us in 1 Peter 5.1. I exhort the elders. That's the poimains. That's the shepherds. Those that are among you as the fellow elder. I'm passing this along. This is not Catholic apostolic successorship. This is simply the mandate extended from Christ through Peter to all who would stand and proclaim God's word and serve God's people. He's a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Do what? Verse 2. Tend my sheep. Poi Maine. Take care of those sheep. Be willing to lay down your life for those sheep. Live sacrificially for those sheep. Lead and feed and protect my sheep. Yeah. It's what Peter was reinstalled for, and it's what all those that would identify as those who would shepherd and lead and serve the people of God. That is our call. In the model, not of Peter, but of the good shepherd. The, I'm, I am at best an under-shepherd, an unworthy under-shepherd. And here's the thing, as I think about this shepherd, my sheep, that's the law of God. And it indicts me as a failure, and it reminds me, the best way for me to shepherd the people of God is not to point them to my very flawed example, but to point them to the unflawed example of their true shepherd, of the good shepherd, the one who laid down his life and he took it up again. Point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of the under-shepherd. And God's in charge of the size of his flock. That's God's business. That's God's business. And so, in this threefold question and answer the apostle Peter reinstated, reinstalled, recharged and tasked with the responsibility of caring for the people of God I believe it extended out to the rest of the disciples inclusive of the apostle Paul and it extends down to everyone who would serve the people of God tend my sheep and then it seems like that Jesus has a final word for Peter. I'm not going to get into the details. I need to move a little more quickly. But simply, it seems to be a prophecy. Peter, you will follow me. You will shepherd. You won't fail this time. And you're going to die a death. 
by following me. You're going to die a death because you followed me. And history tells us that under Nero, probably in the mid-60s of the first century, the Apostle Peter was martyred in Rome. Uh, tradition says that as it came to that time, he said, would you crucify me upside down because I'm unworthy to follow in the steps of my Lord. And so again, the death, the crucifixion, the being stretched out, notice here, this is for all the Joel Osteens and the like of the world, that horrible suffering and ultimate death was how God ordained that Peter would glorify him and accomplish his work. Again, that suffering, I mean, that glory comes through suffering. And again, it flies in the face of the popular notions of the prosperity gospel practitioners. Final word. And I, I think this is another example that Peter was still a flawed man, that there was still some hubris. And, and you know, you, you remember the, mothers, the mother of the sons of Zebedee? What about my boys, Jesus? You got a big role for those guys because they're good boys. You remember there? Who's going to, who is the greatest? Maybe Peter had heard enough of that. Maybe it had pricked him just a little bit too much. Okay, all right, I get it. I get it's not going to be easy. But what about this Yahoo? What about this other guy? Jesus, so sweetly and lovingly, it's none of your business. It's really none of your business. It is up to me how I choose the path of your life the place that I have ordained you to go, the places I've ordained that you would live, that is my business, and I'll reveal it to you at the proper time. But I will be glorified, whether it's a short life or a long life. I will be glorified whether I choose to, to extend to you the most pleasant of providences, but I, or I'll be glorified in you living through and persevering and glorifying me in the most difficult of providences. That's not up to you. That's a secret. It's just up to you to live faithfully. God's plan is good. In some sense, God's plan is known. What is His will for my life? That I be holy. But there's also a secret part of God's plan. A secret part of God's plan. I don't know the day of my death. I do not know what this afternoon holds. I do not know what tomorrow holds. I do not know if good health will be the norm of the balance of my life. I don't know if prosperity will be the norm of my life. I simply don't know. That's in God's hands. But whatever the plan is, it's a good plan. And it's a plan that I trust that He will be glorified through. Through me. Whatever He chooses. And so, John gives a bit of a corrective there in verse 23. So, the scuttlebutt was John wasn't going to die. And John says, no, 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 that's not what Jesus said. They didn't listen any better then than we do now. As I've told you many times, I am shocked and amazed many times as I stand at the back door and people say, Tim, you said so and so and so and so. No, I didn't say that. Well, Tim, you said no and so and so. No, I didn't say that. Yes, you did. Well, let's, let's get the tape and see if I said that. It's amazing. Well, no, Jesus didn't say John was gonna, wasn't going to die. What he said was, what if I choose for John to die, not to die? That's not what he said. So, what if I choose for him not to not die? And this, again, the implication, if that be the case, it's my business. It's my business. And then John's affidavit, we might say at the end. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. And he goes on to explain where every one of them written. Now, I'm sure there's kind of a finite list of things that Jesus did in the course of that earthly ministry. Okay? You know, I mean, if you, if you had the ability to go back, here's what he did day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way through the you know, thousand plus days. You could conceivably write a book. But if you were to write a book about what he did and why he did it and the implications of what he did, and then most importantly, 
you were able to explain how he did it. The mysteries of the power of God in the incarnate Son of God would fill all the volumes that all of the universe could hold and beyond. Because we don't understand the infinite ways in which God chooses to accomplish that which he accomplishes. And so, John's final word is, I have written it. It is true, it's accurate, it's conclusive. He's already told us his purpose, that that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, he's the Son of God, and that through this belief you may know the forgiveness of sin, you may know what eternal life is. And he tells us here in this last word, it's the truth. It's what God gave me to give you. I'm bearing witness to it. I saw it. He would say in his epistles, what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, what our hands have touched. I've given it to you. For God's purpose, as carrying out of God's plan, for the the purpose of the building of the church of the living God. I'm entrusting this truth. God's entrusted it to me. I'm entrusting it to you so that you would be found faithful to tell others. To tell others. Jesus isn't coming back until the appointed time. He's not going to pop up here and there performing miracles. Do do a few sideshows so we can be convinced. No. He's simply going to say, I've invested my word with power. And my son in his ascension sent the spirit. And that spirit is going to empower the church to proclaim my truth for the continuation and establishment of that very church. It's going to be done in a very ordinary way. Very ordinary way. By the means that I indeed have ordained. Again, tend my sheep. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for your truth, uh, for the power of your truth, for the working of your Spirit through that truth. How we would pray that you would bless these things to our hearts, to our minds, that you ultimately would be glorified, uh, that your gospel would be communicated, that your people would be encouraged uh, through uh, your truth. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.